I ran as fast as the wind could carry me, adrenaline powering my skinny little legs. With each step, I whispered a prayer. Please, please let me get there before the loan sharks do. I turned the corner onto Coast Boulevard just as the loan shark's Cadillac pulled into the motel. As the three loan sharks got out of their car with their suitcases full of cash, I raced into the parking lot screaming, Mom! Dad! Don't do it! Mr. Yo's bluffing! My parents promptly called off the deal. The loan sharks grumbled about how they came all this way and went to a great deal of effort to put the money together. So my dad gave them $20 for the gas in their troubles, and they piled back into their car and left. As they drove away, my parents collapsed onto the ground. That was close, my mother exclaimed. My dad put his hand over his pounding heart as he stared at the wide open sky. Thank God, my dad said. As my parents lay panting on the side of the parking lot, I walked over to the front desk and I called Mr. Yao. Mr. Yao, we'd like to make an offer on the motel. $300,000 and not a penny more. He said yes, I screamed, running through the motel. The Weeklies were in Hank's room playing Monopoly. When they heard the news that Mr. Yao agreed to sell to us, Hank slapped the Monopoly board and all the pieces went flying. What did I tell you, Hank said to Billy Bob. If it can happen in Monopoly, it can happen in life. Mr. Yao came over with Jason and his real estate agent the next day. As did Lupe, Lupe's dad, Mr. Cooper, the immigrants, Mr. Abiyan from the convenience store, Mr. Bhagawati from the laundromat, and some of the motel essay people who had driven down because they wanted to see their new motel with their very own eyes. Mr. Cooper brought over his lawyer friend who helped us draw up the contract. There were so many people, we couldn't fit in the manager's quarter. We had to put chairs and tables out in the parking lot. All right, let's get this over with, Mr. Yao said. It took ages for Mr. Yao and his agent to count up all the money. When he was finally convinced it was all there, Mr. Yao lugged the bag over to his car and dumped it into the trunk. His agent then sat down with Mr. Cooper's lawyer and poured over the sales and purchase agreement. We all huddled around them, watching as they wrote in each of our names under buyer. There were so many owners, we had three additional pages just to fill out all our names. My father's voice shook as he told the agent how to spell his name. I never thought this day would actually happen, he said. Me neither, my friend, Hank said, putting an arm around my dad's shoulder. Me neither. When everyone finished signing their names and Mr. Yao officially handed my parents the key, Lupe and I jumped up and down, screaming, We did it! We did it! We did it! Jason smiled. You know what I'm going to do? Hank asked, his eyes twinkling. What? I asked. Hank ran toward the park, sparkling blue pool. He let out a yelp, and he jumped in, fully clothed. Hey! Mr. Yao called, but only with a fraction of his usual voice. You can't jump into my pool with your clothes on. It's not your pool anymore, Hank called back. Mr. Yao opened his mouth to protest, then closed it. One by one, Lupe and all the weeklies and essay people and immigrants jumped in too. My dad threw my mom in, and my mom shrieked with glee. Everyone was waiting for me to come in. I turned to Jason. You coming? I asked him. Jason turned to his dad and asked if he could stay. Mr. Yao scoffed. You don't want to go swimming with these losers, do you? He asked his son. Jason shook his head. No, Dad. I'm going swimming with these winners. Hand in hand, we jumped into the pool. As we splashed and swam in the sun-kissed water, my mother suddenly remembered something very important. Wait, 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 she said. Let's get a picture. I'll take it, Hank jumped out. And as he held up his hand and clicked, I looked around at my new family and smiled. It was a picture I had been waiting a long, long time for the end. So I also want to read to you, um, if you're going to stay with me on this video, uh, there's an author's note. This is the author Kelly Yang. And she has a nice note that um, talks about how her life really relates to Mia's in the book. Many of the events in Front Desk are based on reality. Growing up, I helped my parents manage several motels in California from when I was 8 years old to when I was 12. As a kid, I both loved and feared the Front Desk. I loved the thrill of working, the fact that I could ask an adult for their ID, and they'd give it to me. 
I was also petrified at night. I would go to sleep with this choking, painful anxiety, not knowing what might happen in the middle of the night. The part about me as mom getting beaten up really happened to my own mother. Would both my parents still be there in the morning when I woke up? At school, I couldn't talk about it with any of my friends. How could I explain to them that my parents came to the United States with only $200 in their pocket? That for the first year, I slept on the mattress and we pulled out of the dumpster. I slept on a mattress we pulled out of the dumpster, hoping my dreams greeted me before the stench did. I also couldn't explain the love and hope that grew out of poverty, how much I bonded with the weeklies, how we watched out for one another and celebrated the joys together, however small, how my parents hid fellow immigrants from the boss and used a blue baseball cap on the front desk as their secret sign, how a pair of stray cats had kittens on the back stairwell, and we hid the kittens in the rooms too, how my dad made soup for the customers when they weren't feeling well, how we really did become a family. Our new family helped us get through the loneliness and frustration of our situation. The fact that we left behind our friends and family in China, thinking we were going to a better land, only to see our friends and family get rich back home in a way no one could have ever foreseen. There were 536,000 immigrants from mainland China living in the United States in 1990. Unlike the Chinese immigrants who came before them, the post-1965 Chinese immigrants were, pers were predominantly skilled. They were highly educated, leaving behind good careers. They took a bet that China was not going to change, and they were wrong. Many of them left with very little money because China was still fairly communist in the 80s and the early 90s. China has, of course, modernized greatly since. There is no longer the one-child policy. Now there's the two-child policy. And apartments in Beijing and Shanghai now cost several million U.S. dollars and come with private showers. But in 1990, China, China's per capita GDP was only 317 U.S. dollars. Once in the United States, these immigrants struggled to survive, working long, excruciating hours in manual labor jobs for very little pay. The median annual income in 1989 for Chinese immigrants in the United States was only $8,000, lower than that of any other immigrant group. This unique set of circumstances made these immigrants particularly vulnerable to exploitation and hardship. No group of Chinese immigrants before or since came with quite so little and gave up quite so much. Later, some of these immigrants would go back to China and not recognize the country they left. They would not recognize their brothers and sisters in their designer clothes and handbags. Their brothers and sisters would not recognize them. Neither would the new Chinese immigrants, who would arrive in business class and not understand why anybody would ever turn to the loan sharks. I grew up listening to stories of these immigrants, stories that brought tears to my eyes and chilled the air in my lungs. I'll never forget when my mom's friend came to stay with us and confessed he worked 18-hour days and slept in his boss's basement because his boss took away his passport and ID. I stayed up all night writing his, letter, his boss a letter. Though I was just a kid, my letter scared the boss, and my mom's friend was freed. I hope in telling these stories, the Im these immigrant struggles and sacrifices will not be forgotten. That they will not be forgotten. And to nearly 20 million immigrant children currently living in the United States, 30% of whom are living at below poverty. I hope this book brings some comfort and hope. You are not alone. Somewhere out there, somewhere in the universe, someone in the universe understands exactly what you're going through, including all the fears swirling in your mind or your parents' minds that you're just a bike. You are not a bike. Finally, I hope that through this book, more people will understand the importance of tolerance and diversity the owner of one of our motels we managed told us not to rent to African Americans, saying they were dangerous. This infuriated us, and we did not listen. To this day, my family and I are forever grateful to the many, many wonderful people from all different backgrounds who made us feel welcome in our new country and helped us in times of need. Often, during tough times, the first instinct is to exclude. But this book is about what happens when you include, when... Despite all your suffering and your heartache, you still wake up every morning and look out at the world with fresh, curious eyes. The end. Thank you. I hope we get to see each other soon in class so we can start a new read aloud together. Bye.